The John from 63rd, Dr. Folk. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 30th day, I think I've waited long enough. Uh, I attended the debate in the Senate on second reading on the pay raise bill. And just by, I didn't watch the whole thing, but I watched enough to, to get a few ideas and I made some notes and I held off till now. And uh, as Woody Ireland would say, I kept my powder dry. But I'm gonna use some today. One of the gentlemen over there said, he referenced the West Virginia Constitution. Article seven, I'll read it right from the Constitution. Article seven, the very first thing it said is, the legislature shall provide by general law for a, for a thorough and efficient system of free schools. So I got a couple questions for you. Thorough, do we provide a thorough education? Is it thorough? Can anybody in here actually honestly say that it's thorough? How many students, we've all read the numbers, at least anybody that's followed education in West Virginia, how many students Anywhere from 30% to 60% of our students are taking remedial courses in college. So can you honestly say it's thorough? Efficient. Is it efficient? We spend, I think it's the 17th most in the country ranking in states per pupil. But then you look at our teachers paying its 48th. There's a disconnect. Where's that money going? Now, I'm glad I waited to say this because I've had many conversations with teachers. And in the last 24 hours, I've had a conversation with a clearly Democrat teacher from Kanawha County. She's actually a principal, vice principal. And this morning, I had a conversation with a teacher in Berkeley County. And two things showed up that was common. I mean, one thing that showed up that was common between both of them, wasting money. And I'll give you a couple examples. The one teacher from Berkeley County says, there are books that, and of course, we've actually tried to take up some legislation to solve some of this, instead of having the state mandate what books you use. She says she's got books that she's never used that they were required to buy. Now, the other thing that they agreed on was the use of technology. And in our budgets, it's around $10 million that's going into the classroom for technology. But the one gave an example, each had a different example. So the one, the one said that they had bought Android type devices that were already obsolete and never used. And a former superintendent, I don't know what the current superintendent's idea is, but the former state superintendent of schools wanted to put a device in every kid's hand. And in Berkeley County, some of our schools, not all of them, but some of them, each student has a, I think it's called a Chromebook. They're $100 to $200 a piece. I don't know about you, but my priority would rather be, and both teachers agreed on this, we've got kids coming into high school and into middle school that can't write a simple sentence or make change, but yet we're going to give them an electronic device at $100 to $200 a piece that has probably an 18-month life cycle. Where are our priorities? That's insane. But yet, we had a superintendent, and like I said, I don't know where the other superintendent is. I do know that our current superintendent, sorry, he's probably not going to like what I say, but he was the founder, one of the people, he was actually the head of the Superintendent's Association in the whole country when Common Core came to West Virginia. Guess where he left when he left West Virginia? Guess where he went? Does anybody know? He actually signed a contract while he still was here and served his last month. He went to a book publisher. And the one thing that I've talked about in these teachers, and it's a common theme, there are certain subjects you really don't need to change the books every four or five years. Math hasn't changed. Basic math, K through 12, has not changed in basically 100 years. But yet we waste money on things that are irrelevant to kids learning how to read and write. Now, maybe the reason we haven't done anything in this body is we spent so much time 
demagoguing PEIA. Now, if you look in the private sector, believe it or not, PEIA is a pretty daggone good deal. I had this conversation with the gentleman right over there against the wall. Right there. He's on his phone right now. That, you know, you better watch where you go on this because the public, the private sector has gotten hammered increased health care costs. Their premiums, their deductibles, their copays have at least doubled. Now, I have a great deal of sympathy for the public employees because they haven't gotten a raise like some of these people in the private sector have, including me. I've gotten raises. But let's talk about the PEIA. Since everybody wants to make the PEIA board out to be the, the person that's the bad guy, I just got on their website last night. Four independents on the board, three Democrats, one Republican, and then the chairman's appointed by the governor. And at the time, all of these were appointed, I believe they were appointed by a Democrat governor. The majority of them, I believe, were appointed by a Democrat governor. So, you know, don't be a Johnny-come-lately saying you want to abolish something. When, you, when you're in a majority, you didn't want to do it. And as the gentleman, I believe, from the 14th here said, is that, I got that right, Jim? The gentleman from the 14th said, and I know this for a fact because I was in the legislature, we came in together. They spent down the reserves. They didn't put any money in. They spent them down. And in fact, the last year that you all were in control, the budget that was passed and signed, I think it was line item vetoed a little bit, but what was ultimately became law took over $100 million from the rainy day fund. You know, and, and, and I, I know now, I think I've got enough respect from the other side of the aisle that I call a spade a spade, and it don't matter if you're a D or an R. So now I'm going to come over on what I witnessed last week. The other side of the aisle last week was saying we can't find the money for the raises, for the increased raises. Well, the gentleman from the first who, I don't know where he went, and the gentleman from the 27th said during the early part of the session where we could get the money. We're, we're going to do a three to four-fold increase right now in the development offices, 10 million to about 45 million. There's 35 million dollars. Now we could still give them a million bucks. That'd be a 10 percent increase. That's more than the teachers are going to get. I can guarantee you that. But that still nets out to 34 million dollars. The tourism goes from six to 20. That's 14 million dollars. We can give them another million bucks. They still get more than a 10 percent increase, and you just netted out another. $13 million. Now, the proposal that I understand that, that is before us in the past hour of finance, and that we're going to vote on. First of all, I have a really hard time reconciling the governor last year offering a 2% raise, and for some reason now he can only offer a 1% raise, even though we had a much worse budget crisis last year than we have this year. My understanding is, the, and, and maybe the chair of finance will shake his head in agreement, that the fix that we've offered up, that we voted as a resolution on yesterday, is going to cost about $30 million. $30 million. That's $30 million that, that the biggest thing about that $30 million is that that benefit that goes to those employees, they don't pay taxes on. If we gave it to them in the, in the form of a raise instead and left PEIA with the, the changes, they're going to have to pay taxes on it on a great large percentage of the raise. Whereas if we stick with the 2% raise, which raises the cost about 20 million, now we've ate up around $50 million of that other money that I said was a waste. So as the gentleman from Huntington talked about corporate welfare, that's what I believe it is. It's central planning, as the gentleman said. It's going to end up with some of it at the Greenbrier. We have a good plan that passed out of finance yesterday. And as long as the money is taken from the place that I've identified, and I've got a few others, by the way, there's a gentleman that just happens to want to fly from Morgantown to Charleston a lot. He spent over a million dollars a year flying. And last session alone, last session, he spent about $100,000 just flying to Charleston. I got all the facts. It's, it's ridiculous. I can find you some more money, three to five million dollars from HEPC. We've got legislation right now that, that 
that I know that some of the leadership is concerned about because the ATPC might come out and go, ooh, we can't have that. Three to five million dollars. Direct cost. That's not, you count when they're charging the institutions. And I know, obviously, there's some receptiveness to that from our four-year schools because we passed an amendment to include Shepard in the ATPC bill last year. And by the time I got over to judiciary, I'm sure the gentleman, uh, the chair of education, will shake his head that every school wanted out. Every school came. Every four-year school wanted out. There's three to five million dollars. I can go on. You want me to keep going? We can get this raised up to three percent if you really want to. It's just a matter of priorities. And right now, nobody in this body, and that's why I voted for the gentleman's motion to discharge, nobody wants to abolish government in here except for maybe me and McGeehan. They talk to, they talk that they do. They talk that they do. They talk the good game. But the problem is, when Gordon Gee can just jump in his plane and fly down here in about 45 minutes instead of drive two hours, two hours, it's, it's 150 miles, and most of the speed limit is 70 miles an hour. He doesn't even have to drive. He's got enough. He's a, he could make his lobbyists drive him. He's spending over half a million, WVU is spending over half a million dollars. You want to know who controls this state more than probably anybody? It sets up there in Morgantown. Because every one of your four-year institutions, every one of them besides WVU, loses because of the political money they spend down here in, in Charleston. Nobody from Shepherd, nobody from Blue Ridge has the time or the money to run down here to, to Charleston to lobby. So who gets all the money? And they blow it. I'm a graduate of WVU. I have a, I have a graduate degree there. Oh, by the way, do you want to know what fund that money comes out of? You want to really get torqued off if you're a parent out there listening? It comes out of the tuition fund. It's time for this legislature, and I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, to start doing something. Thank you. John for the 50th Dr. Computer. I'd like to ask unanimous consent that my friend from the 16th, the other Sean, 